living creatures are made up of tiny functional units called cells. While we humans and our mammalian friends are made of millions of cells, we are surrounded by single-celled organisms such as bacteria and yeasts. Cells can be divided up into prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotes are smaller, simpler, and more primitive. They're either bacteria or archaea. Eukaryotic cells are more complex and are either plant cells or animal cells, which are the building blocks of us humans. The average animal cell is around 10 micrometers in diameter, much too small to see with the naked eye. Under a light microscope, however, which can magnify our cell samples up to 1,500 times, we can see the internal workings, known as the ultrastructure of cells. Though we are made up of many different cells, they have certain features in common. All animal cells are essentially sacs of fluid in which are floating lots of components called organelles, which all work together synergistically, rather like a country. The sac is called the cell membrane or plasma membrane. It is selectively permeable, meaning that it allows some substances to enter while excluding others. Continuing our country analogy, the cell membrane is like the country's borders, controlling what, and who, comes in or goes out. The cytoplasm is the fluid inside. It is predominantly water, with substances dissolved in it. The nucleus is analogous to parliament and controls the activities of the cell. It contains DNA, the organism's genetic material, which is a blueprint for how to create an organism, and instructions for how to make it function. As you might imagine, living creatures are pretty complicated, so the blueprints are lengthy. If you uncoiled all the DNA from a single human cell, it would be about two meters long. If you think about how easily your cables get tangled, just imagine two meters of DNA, just 12 nanometers in width, condensed into a nucleus only six micrometers across. Quite incredible, really. The cytoplasm contains millions of granules called ribosomes, which are like the cell's factories. They receive recipes, mRNA, sent out from the nucleus and synthesize all the proteins we need to function. All this activity requires energy, which is supplied by mitochondria, the cell's power stations. Aerobic respiration takes place here, transferring the energy from the food we eat into high energy molecules easily used by the cell to fuel its metabolism. Moving on to plant cells, these have all the same organelles as animal cells and a number of extra features. Ever wondered why plants look green? Plant cells, those above ground at least, are packed with chloroplasts, membrane-bound structures which contain the pigment chlorophyll. Chloro comes from the ancient Greek chloros, meaning pale green. Chlorophyll absorbs light energy and uses it to make glucose from carbon dioxide and water in a process called photosynthesis. In the center of plant cells is a large central permanent vacuole, a sac of fluid which helps to support plants structurally and acts as a temporary storage of sugars, amino acids, and other substances. Surrounding the cell membrane is a cell wall made of the strong fibrous material cellulose. When a plant has recently been watered, you'll notice that it perks up because the water enters its cell, so the cytoplasm expands and pushes against the cell wall, a state we call turgid. The cell wall prevents too much water from entering and causing the cell to burst. When you chew a stick of celery, one of my least favorite activities, the stringy fibers that get stuck in your teeth and are supposed to prevent <clears throat> constipation are made of cellulose. Similarly, cotton fibers, which we spin and weave into the latest fashions, are almost pure cellulose. Animal and plant cells are both building blocks of larger, multicellular organisms. As we said, both cell types are eukaryotic cells. They are distinct from prokaryotes, predominantly because they have organelles surrounded by membranes. The nucleus, mitochondria, and chloroplasts are all membrane-bound. Bacterial cells are prokaryotes and look quite different. They are much smaller. They have no membranes around their internal components. This bacterium here is E. coli, resident in the gut of every human. It is only about two micrometers long. While it has a wall around its plasma membrane to protect the cell from damage, the cell wall is made of protein, not cellulose. Instead of chromosomes contained in the nucleus, prokaryotes have circular DNA in a nucleoid, a nucleus-like region, which forms a single loop in the cytoplasm, only millimeters in circumference. In addition, it has plasmids, tiny loops of DNA containing survival genes, such as resistant genes to antibiotics, which it can replicate and pass on to other bacteria. Though bacteria have ribosomes since they also need to make proteins, their ribosomes are smaller. Finally, bacterial cells may need to move and so have one or more tails called flagella, which propel them around their environment. 
Looking at these cells, you might observe that prokaryotes bear a resemblance to eukaryotic organelles, which are about the same size and feature a double membrane, which is what you would get if one cell engulfs another. And so, at the turn of the 20th century, scientists proposed the endosymbiotic theory, which suggested that certain membrane-bound organelles of eukaryotic cells are descendants of formerly free-living prokaryotes. Fascinating stuff, right? So why are these differences important in the modern world? Well, many infections are caused by bacteria. We've all suffered food poisoning after eating something dodgy. Perhaps it was caused by salmonella. Have you ever coughed up buckets of green phlegm while suffering raging fevers? That might have been streptococcus pneumoniae. We can take antibiotics to kill the bacteria without killing human cells by exploiting the differences in cell structure. Some work by disrupting bacterial cell walls, which are absent from animal cells, while others prevent protein synthesis in bacterial cells, but not animal cells. Sometimes there are structural similarities and we experience side effects when we take antibiotics. So next time you experience an episode of tonsillitis, or chew a stick of celery, or struggle with the tangled cables for your electronic devices, take a moment to reflect on cell structure.